On Monday, the Department of Health will be launching a brand new pilot program to electronically exchange information between medical providers. The health information exchange pilot goes through the end of September and it includes the hospitals, some health centers, the Department of Health's clinics, private providers, a pharmacy and a lab. Ms. Erica Parsons has more. The Department of Health is helping the territory's healthcare system move forward. Monday, they'll be launching a three-month pilot for a health information exchange. The exchange is, is the first of its kind in the territory. While there's some small networks provided by, for example, the hospitals to their affiliated providers, this exchange allows all the providers in the territory to exchange patient information. The department's Health Information Technology Division has been working for some time with Secure Exchange Solutions to develop the system that can share information faster, help with transition care, and even lower costs for providers. The project is designed to ensure that every provider has at least one option for health information exchange that meets the requirements of the Medicare and Medicaid electronic health record incentive programs. So while participation is not mandatory, Providers who have adopted an EHR and wish to recoup a portion of the cost need to electronically exchange data in order to qualify for the incentive payment. Other providers are being encouraged to use the exchange because it will help to improve transitions of care and operating efficiency. So what does this mean for you? It means no more waiting for fax machines, couriers, or even you, the patient, to deliver medical records. Key information can be shared between your doctor and this hospital, for example, and it can all be done with the touch of a button. When one provider needs to get information on a patient that another provider has, provider A is going to use his secure messaging address, push the information to provider B, who will be the only recipient who can open that message. The records will only be shared when needed. The system also has other uses, some of which are the admission and discharge notification that can let your primary doctor know when you've been admitted and released from the hospital and what care you received. The required communicable disease reporting and immunization reporting are two more examples. Providers who want to participate in the exchange will need to register with the Health Information Technology Division at the Department of Health. Erica Parsons, News 2. The new system will also allow the information to be shared with national health care providers. Providers who want more information can contact Kevin Hodge at 715-5101 or Kathleen Greenaway at 773-1311 extension 4226. The Office of Veterans Affairs will be hosting a series of seminars for veterans and their family members this month on post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD awareness. Acting Director Harry Daniels said the disorder is medically recognized. It can develop from seeing or experiencing an event that involves actual or threatened death or serious injury to which a person responds with intense fear. It is not uncommon among veterans. That will be held on June 24th, 6.30 p.m. at the Julius Browse School on St. John. June 25th, 6.30 p.m. at the Patrick U. George American Legion Post 90. That's in Sub Bay St. Thomas. And then on June 26th, 6.30 p.m. as well at Bromley Berkeley American Legion Post, number 133 in Fredericksburg, St. Croix. Well, if you have one handy, you know it has been very successful and helpful. The Directory of Community Organizations Serving the U.S. Virgin Islands, CFVI, is currently preparing to publish an updated 2013 to 2015 edition. Nonprofit organizations can ensure they are included in the directory by filling out the form that can be found on their website. Also, the 13th annual USVI Kids Count Data Book was launched today during the Children and Families Council meeting at Government House in Christian said St. Croix. The child focused data reports provide crucial information on the state of the territory's children from birth to 18. Lawmakers receive data and proven policy solutions from CFVI. Well, iPods, MP3s, earbuds, how much damage could these cause when it comes to hearing? Here's more into your health. They're everywhere. Personal audio devices. Millions are plugged in. But can't they hurt your hearing? There certainly are levels that are safe for long periods of time, but uh, that can quickly change as the level goes up. Mayo Clinic audiologist Lindsay Wagner tests personal audio device volume levels in her office so people can be sure the levels are safe. Might tickle a little bit here. 
Dr. Wagner is concerned about two things, how loud the volume is. It's pretty loud. And how long you listen at that level. 50% on that volume, Will, you can wear safely all day long if you wanted to, but if you go up to, let's say, 60 or 70% on your volume, Will, depending on the system that you're using, maybe you'd only be able to wear that safely for four hours. That's because as volume levels go up, the amount of time you should wear the device goes down dramatically. This reading shows an average volume of 97 decibels. I see that she can wear that for only about 30 minutes before uh, putting her hearing at risk. What happens to your ears is this. Music goes in through the eardrum to the middle ear bones and then to the inner ear, which is lined with tiny hair cells. Loud music can damage those hair cells, causing hearing loss. So if your ears hurt or ring, it means your hearing is at risk. Damage could be temporary, but if you listen to loud levels for too long, the damage could be permanent. It won't make you go completely deaf. But it could make some voices and sounds hard to hear. The bottom line, be aware of how loud your volume setting is. And if you're concerned, see an audiologist to help you set safe levels. Good advice. Stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next.